Jesus, my Lord. Glory to God Almighty. Have a seat, if you will. We'll go right into prayer requests. Brother Isaac, come on up here and lead this section, if you will. And then, Brother Jeff, you just be ready to take up our offering right after this section. But Isaac, guide us through that list. Talk to us a little bit about what you think might be needed as well. Also, I want you to know the Long family, who is uh, very strongly tied to Roy and Christine, uh, has had a loss. Um, where is Roy and Christine? Back here. Roy, do you want to talk a little bit about it, explain the situation? You go right ahead, my man, if you will. Just real briefly. Anybody else have a loss recently? Anybody else? Difficulty, hardship in that way? Well, we'll certainly be praying for the Tower Long family. Her name is Betty. Towers Long, okay. All right, Isaac? All righty, so right now we're about to break off into groups for the prayer requests. And uh, you'll notice a lot of people have these little sheets right here. And many of you should have gotten some uh, as you came in. But if you didn't get one, please raise your hand and one of our greeters and ushers will bring some to you. All right, we got some people who still need the prayer request sheets. So the greeters are going to start making their way around. And so while the greeters are right now about to pass out the prayer sheets to those who need it, if you guys could keep your hands up. Uh, greeters, they should be coming. <laughs> All right, so while we're waiting, uh, real quick, is there any other prayer requests that anybody might have? Because the Bible says that the prayers of the righteous avails much. So if you need some availing in your life, you know, the church is the perfect place to make your requests made known. So if you have a prayer request that you would like prayed for tonight that's not on the list, if you could also raise your hand. Uh, Brother Eddie, you got one? Shirley Shaw, okay, and then uh, Brother Jay. Okay, absolutely. Anyone else? All right, I don't see any more hands, so... Right now, we'll go ahead and break off into groups for the prayer requests. Right. And so, uh, if you could please keep those extra people in your minds as you pray.
What a blessing. Man, I love seeing this church group come together like you are. Praise Jesus for that. Good group of teenagers and young people, too, tonight. Praise Jesus. Brother Jeff, why don't you come and guide us in the offering time? Ushers, be at the ready, if you will. Amen. If we can have the ushers come forward at this time. And we appreciate you guys very, very much. It's, it's a great privilege to work with these gentlemen. Being uh, brought in as an usher, I enjoy that very much and appreciate the duties that they do. They're fantastic yes. and a great, great group of men. Mm. We bless them. Now, this is an opportunity that God's given to us that we can give back to him. What a blessing that truly is. Yeah. And I'm going to ask Brother Brad if he'll lead us, please. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, how grateful we are, Lord, for the material blessing that you give us, Lord. And we know that in this world and in the functions of the church, Lord, that we have to have the resources and finances to continue to move forward. And we ask that in all that's given and said and done, that we'll use the wisdom given to us from God in the direction of the Holy Spirit to be good administrators and, and, uh, and administer finances in the proper way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. Good evening, everybody. How about if everybody stands up? All right. We're going to be singing hymn number 92, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Amen. Amen. Great. Yes. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. Tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because he first loved me. Amen. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Got two more, Pastor. Two more. Two more. Two I'm just more. excited, man. Amen. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here we go. It tells me what my Father had in store for every day. And though I never start this path, Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. Uh, now, right? Yeah, okay. Have a seat. <laughs> Have a seat. 
You know, I know some of you out there that say all he needs is the round red nose on his face and he'll be complete. Isn't that right? I saw you laughing, Emmanuel. You liked that one, didn't you? You, want me to, you? you guys know that. You understand who the clown pastor is. Hey, let me tell you nine things about what's going on, all right, to start with. Antonio, I'm blessed by you, bro. Man, I appreciate this guy. Chris, it's a blessing to have you here. It really is. Antonio, man, it's such an honor, man. I, I had the opportunity to text a little bit with this fella, and the Lord's working in him, man. I'm grateful for that. I can tell. D, it's a joy to have you here, honey. See, is there anybody that's a little bit newer besides these three? Okay, man, that's great for Wednesday night. I know there's some new teenagers, well, newer teenagers, Nick and his uh, uh, sister Shelby as well, and it's just so cool to watch how the Lord's working, and the steeple people get me excited, man. I'm telling you, I was watching, how many of you saw some of those videos? Did you see that? Isn't that cool, some of those pictures? I mean, Julie, man, what a queen. She just turned out, like, beautiful. They all did little uh, dress-up skits and stuff like that, and that's for me, that's number eight that I'm going to tell you about tonight. Some of the steeple people are involved in True Word, and that gets me excited. Okay, number one, people who want to be members and have already met with the deacons will present a group who have already been inducted in, but we have not brought you before the congregation. We'll be bringing you before the congregation so we can complete our list of members and then those that still have not met with the deacons will continue to go through their process so they can become members here. Number two, if you know someone who would like to be baptized this Sunday, please talk to me tonight, okay? Talk to me tonight or call me, text me tomorrow, however that be. But we want to make sure you get that in early in case you want to have baptism, okay? Number three, tomorrow at four o'clock, we're doing follow-up visitation. Yesterday, we did street preaching. My dad was there. That was neat, we had a great time. And dad, man, I tell you what, he's, he's something else. He got out there and waved at people and while I was preaching. We must have dealt with probably 100 people. And so you just continue to pray for that ministry. Tomorrow at 7 o'clock, Strong Men's is meeting. Great time. And we'll come to great times. How many of you have been a part of Strong Men's before? Look at all the hands, man. I'm going to tell you something. It's a great time. Come, enjoy, have a fun time with it. Number five, Friday, please consider coming with a friend to Reformers Unanimous. We have some new people that have been coming. The last time we had Reformers Unanimous, there were 13. The Friday before that, there were 14. And I believe that this Friday is going to be up over. I believe that. You want to bring somebody to Reformers Unanimous, please be welcomed, okay? Understand that. What we've done is we streamlined Reformers Unanimous so that it's the same exact, I mean exact program. It feels longer, actually. I, th I think it feels longer for the way that we do it, but we're just not putting in so many commercials, okay? <laughs> I guess is the way to put it. But it's really, really good. Starts at 7 and ends promptly at 8.30, and you'll have a great time. Then we'll do snacks and stuff after that. And then, number six, Missions conference team meeting. Uh, what night is best for those of you who want to be on that committee? There are 10 of you who want to be on the missions conference committee. You start thinking now and text me, okay? Those of you who signed up to be a part of the missions conference committee, text me what nights we should meet. I think there should be some weeks where we meet twice and I'm excited about this year because I think there's more going on now with missions than we've ever had. And I, we're ahead on that and grateful for what God is doing. August the 28th, Epic Involvement Banquet. Two things about that, number seven. Number one, if you want to be a part of building the tables, I want you to sign up for that on the back table. If you want to be a part of bringing part of the banquet food, whether that be meats or whether that be sides or casseroles, don't forget that's on the 28th in the evening, okay? True word. Ah, oh, man, I've been waiting to get to this one. This is exciting. Listen to this. Get this. You ready for this? 49 students have signed up for true word. That, yes, that's, that blows my mind. At least one is excited. That's good. Okay, Sandy Bryant, Justin, uh, uh, 
Justin Bryan, Charlene Hastings, Arlene, Ar Arlene Myers, Bev James, Tom, and Sarah are actually going to be part of the self-defense with me. Uh, Pearl at Bernardino, Matt Banks, Jack Seacrest, Austin Hammond, Carol Webb, Ruth Ricksecker, uh, Kathy Muller, Dustin Taylor, Hilda Dashiell, Sandy Rice, Lynn Howell, Hunter Hastings, Andy Webb, uh, Pam Daisy, Michaela Daisy, Ellie Bradford, Taylor Mueller, Danny Hastings, Ruth Flores, Marion Jones, Edna C. Diaz, uh, Ed Hall, Anthony Secrets, Betty Evans, Kenny Evans, Michaela Evans, the entire Evans family, Becca Spirella, Emma Dyer is actually going to be a part of self-defense. I think I love seeing the little kids take self-defense. That's going to be cool. Jessica Weaver, Becky Evans, Isaac Valdez, Paula Gilbert, Andrea Hastings, Elizabeth uh, Seacrest, Angie Hastings, Michaela Rimbold, Jeff Willie, Stephanie. Uh, I don't know that I know her last name. I'm going to be, I've got her number though. Travis Smith. Uh, what is it? Utsler. Okay, there you go. I wondered. I wondered. There you are, man. God bless you. I'm so excited. Angie Hastings. I've already said it. Judith West, Eric Wingate, and Christine Wingate signed up today. They were the last two, uh, Eric Wingate and uh, Christine Wingate. Now you say, what are the classes? Okay, listen to this. Biblical translation work, child training, biblical historical context, which is hermeneutics, diet and exercise, self-defense, ethics and church administration, Choosing to walk with God, music and the drama team, biblical counseling, studying your Bible, developing as a lady, uh, medical missions, uh, biblical, uh, pardon me, yeah, and that's it, that's it. There's the 12 major doctrines as well that will be conglomerated into one session, and we'll be going through that. Now, that's a 90-day commitment, starts on September the 5th, ends on December the 10th, and then it starts up in January 23rd and ends in May, May the 4th, so it's 90 days, just about on each end in the fall and in the spring. And so there are 11 teachers, four that are substitutes. And I just can't believe it came together this quick. I am overwhelmed. I mean, it is a miracle. So continue to pray for true word. And yes, now you can applaud. Okay, yes, please go ahead. I am excited about seeing so many. So if you want to be a part of this, this, this is not closed. It will not be closed until the last week of August. You have plenty of time to think. But by the last week of August, I'm going to have to start closing classes so that we can get everything set up for September the 5th, where they're going to be in the buildings, okay? You say, when are the classes? Monday through Sunday, two hours each night from 6 o'clock and then on to 7, and then 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Some of the professors have already chosen their evenings uh, I could go through and tell you some of those, but I'd much rather have it printed up by Sunday and give that to you so you know exactly when each of the classes are. I know some of you are still like, I can't make a commitment until I know exactly when those classes are. I get you, and we'll take care of that Sunday. Brother Garrett, I love you, man. I have, I have started calling Garrett equal. All right. Does anybody know what equal means in Spanish? Son. All right. Son. All right, so equal, he, he is my Spanish son in the Lord. <laughs> Spanish. Not Spanish, English. <laughs> oh, come and take this pulpit, buddy. I love you. Amen. I'm very happy that <laughs> there is a discipleship program like what Pastor is, is putting forth. It's so important. I didn't realize how important classes were until I, I, I went to Bible college. There's nothing really special about Bible college, but it is a place where you learn and grow. And I hate school. My mom can tell you. Did you shut me off? I'm sorry. Listen, number nine, I told you there were nine things. The softball sign-up is on the back there. Amen. Uh, sorry about that. And softball sign-up, there are eight that are already signed up, I think, for softball. You go ahead and do that. Okay, Garrett, go for it. But, <laughs> uh, but it, is, it is a tremendous thing to be able to take classes to learn. I didn't know how much I didn't know until I realized how much I didn't know. <laughs> so it's a good thing. If you can do it, I encourage you, just learn what you can when you can. It's always a treasure. So I want to ask ask you, the church, my church family, what do you guys think our mission is? As a church, as an individual, what do you think our mission is? And you can go ahead, and if you've got an answer, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand. What do you think our, Brother Jay? 
Be missionaries. Yes, the Great Commission. This isn't where we're going to be tonight, but I just want to open up with this. Matthew chapter 28. Of course, this is Jesus Christ, his last words to his disciples. It's what we call the Great Commission. It's our job. It's our mission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So that is the Great Commission. That is our mission. It wasn't just given to the apostles. It wasn't just given to the preachers. It wasn't just given to the missionaries. It was given to every single believer that has ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You may not realize it, but you are a missionary. You may not go to the foreign countries like we had displayed uh, this past Sunday. You may not go even leave Delaware, but that just means that your mission field is Delaware, that your mission field is Sussex County, that your mission field is Seaford. Wherever God has placed you, it is your job to fulfill the Great Commission. And that is our mission. That's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. The main text we're going to be in is Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. So this mission is only for a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't know what a disciple is, the definition is a follower, one who emulates or, or duplicates another in themselves. If you can kind of get this idea, it's, it's like a life transfer. When we're talking about discipleship, Jesus, he wasn't just teaching them how to live their lives well. He was teaching them how to live their lives like himself. The word Christian literally means little Christ. At first it was a rebuke to the church, but I mean, that's what we want to be identified as. Little Christ, followers of Christ, Christ-like. So discipleship is life transfer. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to look like Jesus Christ. And that great commission, it is for a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, while we're here in this passage tonight, the context of it is Jesus is talking to his disciples, specifically his apostles. Now, there, there's a difference there. There's a difference between an apostle and a disciple. For instance, if you are living like Christ, you are a disciple. But I can promise you not a single one of us in here is an apostle. You see, an apostle is somebody who has seen the risen Christ. And often at the beginning of the church age, God gave them special power. He imbued them with different gifts of the Holy Spirit that is not available today. The Pentecostals would say, oh yes, you can do all these things. You can heal, you can cast out, you can speak in tongues. But no, that's not true. Only the apostles were given that power, and that was only for a short time. As we read the book of Acts, we even see in their life it fading. At the very beginning of the church age, after Jesus Christ ascended, he sent out his apostles to fulfill this mission, this great commission, and he gave them these powers as signs, kind of like as a, as a jump start. It started with the Jews, and the Jews required a sign. So they worked these miracles, and it jump started the church and moved forward, and as the church moved on and souls got saved, that power, it, it started to go away. So I want to make it very clear, as we're getting into this text, we do not have apostolic power. We are not apostles, but we are disciples, and so were they. So in your mind, Jesus' 12 followers, they were disciples and they were apostles, but we are just disciples. So there's things in here specifically for them, and there's things in here specifically for us. Take what is given for us and then apply that into your life. So Christ is talking to his 12 apostles, and he's talking to them about their mission. And that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be reading kind of the details of this mission. If this is our purpose in life, if this is, if this is why we're still on the earth, surely I know I would want to know all about it. If that's my whole purpose for being... What, what should I expect? What should be going on? So, and I know many of you are well familiar with this mission. Many of you have accepted this mission and have been living it, but how well? 
Have you been living it? Maybe you're somebody who has heard the mission and, and still kind of on the fence. Like, should I commit to it? Or uh, my life is pretty great right now. I don't know if I should. This message is for you too. So read with me if you will. Matthew reading in verse 1. When he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Those are the things I'm talking about, not for us. Verse number two, now the names of the 12 apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So these are the 12 followers of Jesus, his close group, the people who walked with him and lived with him and tried to emulate his life in their own. Now, there was nothing tremendously special about these people. We know four of them were just simple fishermen. We know even from this text that Matthew, he was a publican, he was a tax collector. And as you go through, you see these this about them. They're ordinary people. And what's really encouraging is God loves to use ordinary people, which is really good for me because there isn't anything special about me. I'm just glad that God wants to use me. And God wants to use you too. So never think that, oh, I, I never went to Bible college or I never took a class so I can't serve. God. There are people who have never set foot in a Bible college who know way more Bible than I do. Amen. It's not about who you are. It's about who he is. You just got to let him work through you. These men were not exceptional in any way, but God used them to do exceptional things. These were the 12. Verse number five. These 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely ye give. Once again, this is not us. We do not preach the gospel of the kingdom, we preach the gospel of, of grace. We don't go just to the Jews, we go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Yes. See, these apostles, while Jesus was still there, this is what they were doing, just the Jews. The Bible says go to the Jew first, then the Greek. They were working here, but not only are we not apostles, but we're also not living in the same time as them. We're living in the New Testament age. We're living in the church age. So the gospel is the gospel of grace, and the people is everybody. There is no difference between Jew or Greek. There is no difference between man or woman. Everybody can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we're supposed to go, and we're supposed to preach that. Now, we can't heal the sick. We can't cleanse lepers. We can't raise the dead, but here's what we can do. The bottom of verse 8 the word says this, Jesus says this to his disciples, freely ye have received, freely give. Brother Richard, if you could go to Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. I ask people sometimes, what do you think the scariest verse in the Bible is? What do you think the scariest verse in the Bible is? I've heard a lot of people say, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. Oh, that is terrifying, but not for us. If you're saved, if you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and cleanse you from your sin, you will never hear those words. Instead, you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom of God. But for me, this is the scariest passage in the Bible, I think. Let's go ahead and read it. Why don't we read it all together? Verse 47, ready, and, and that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Next verse. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. The context of this, Jesus is talking basically about a, a, a negligent servant. Somebody who knows the will of their master and just doesn't do it or just puts it off. And, and the master comes home and he sees the work's not done and, and he says the, he gets punished severely. And the warning, the warning that God gives in that parable is right there at the bottom of that verse, middle of the verse. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. 
To me, that's the scariest verse in the Bible because I look at my life, I look at my country, I look at my church, and I think to myself, I have been given so, so, so much. The fact that we can even be in a church building with no threat of death is a gift from God, something that the majority of the world does not have. And because of that, man, we take it for granted. So many times it's, oh, I got something else going on so I can't be in church tonight. While there's people on the other side of the world who would kill just to be able to sit and listen to a group sing about God without worrying about their life. We have been, as Americans, in the free world, we have been given so, so much. But that means it's required of us much. And going back to our key text here, Matthew chapter 10, and then verse number 8, freely ye have received, freely ye give. I want you, my dear church family, to think about what God has given you. Many here have wonderful families, wonderful kids. I get the privilege to teach them every now and again, and they are great. Many of you have wonderful friends, and I know you guys are in a wonderful church. Now, I know we all have different health issues and different concerns, but the fact that you're even able to walk in this building and sit down and have ears and eyes and listen, and the fact that you have a Bible, the King James Bible, in your lap, and you're reading the Word of God straight from the pages right to you, the very mind of God is sitting in your lap. Wow! To whom much is given of him, much is required. Imagine how much the disciples were given. All this apostolic power, all these gifts, how much was required of them. Understand this, our mission as disciples of Jesus Christ, our mission as little Christs, preach the word. Because the greatest thing we've been given, the greatest thing that has freely been given to us, that we have freely received, is salvation. Nothing can compare. Hey, you're not going to hell. Holy cow, you are saved. You're going to heaven. Hallelujah. My goodness. But to whom much is given, of whom much is required. So, hey, who are you telling the gospel to? Who have you told the gospel to today? Can you think of a faith this week that you've talked to? Ah, I can think of one. That's good. What about two? What about three? The verse says, freely ye have received, freely ye give. Now, all the other stuff I had just read was for the apostles, was for their age, for their time. But right now, for you, disciple of Jesus Christ, in the New Testament age, freely ye have received, freely give. How's your given? We could go through a list of things about your money, your time, but very plainly, I feel the most important thing is giving the gospel. What you have freely received at no cost to yourself. It cost Jesus Christ everything. It cost you nothing. Who are you giving that to? The Great Commission is to go ye therefore. Go and give. We'll keep reading here. Verse number 9. This is Jesus explaining how the disciples are going to carry out this mission. He says this in verse number 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And in whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And once again, it's hard to kind of picture this because we don't live like they lived. We don't go from town to town. You know, Jesus Christ said the foxes have dens, but, and there's another animal, I can't remember it, shame on me, but he has no place to lay his head. He has no home. And the disciples, if they're living like he's living, they didn't have that either. So they went from town to town preaching the gospel. They didn't have hardly any money. They didn't have hardly any clothing. They didn't have hardly any anything, but they had Jesus. And here's the thought. We don't live like that today. We don't really even work that way today. But the important thing here is... They did it trusting God. They trusted God for their provision. They trusted God for their shelter, for their food. Everything they needed, they trusted God to provide. And that's the second point I'd like to bring out. Our first point here, this mission is our great commission. Point number two, I'd like you to realize this mission is a mission of faith. Can't be done without it. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Brother Richard, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 
Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You say, how do, how do we know who to talk to? How, do, how did the disciples know where to go and, 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 and who to preach to? And it, trust God. Amen. Trust God. Yeah. If you're going to carry out this mission, little Christ, if you're going to carry out this mission, disciple, it's got to be a mission of faith. You say, well, how, 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 how am I even going to talk to somebody? How am I supposed to go to them and talk to them? I don't even know what to say. Gonna... If God called you to it, you don't need to worry about it. If God called you to it, then he's going to do it if you let him work. Trust God in this mission, in this co-mission of going into all the world. Hey, the world is a scary place. My goodness, it is terrifying. It is so scary. Even in America where everything is, is so cushy and wonderful, it's terrifying. My first week in New Jersey, some guy threatened to kill me. I came from Sussex County where the only scary thing was an angry woman from the Homeowners Association. And then my first week in Jersey, some guy uh, runs down the street, chases after me and says he's going to kill me and curses me out. And all I had with me was three girls and and one of them was definitely going to fight. I knew that. But I was scared. I was like, my goodness, this is like a whole other planet. What is going on here? But God provided. And it was miraculous how he did. And I praise the Lord for it. I didn't get any scrape on me. It shook me up a little bit. It's like, here? That this is where God wanted me to be. And if God wants me to be there, then whatever happens to me there, it's his will, not mine. I don't have to worry about it. Look with me at verse 14 and 15. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, then ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable of judgment that city. When I was a younger man, I, well, younger than I already am, I read that and I looked at the whole idea of shaking the dust off your feet. I used to think that was just forsake them. They didn't receive the gospel, so just forsake them, add, throw them off and, and, and keep on walking. But as I look at the verse more and more, I, I don't think it's shaking them off. I think it's shaking their offense off. Because, my goodness, people are going to hate your guts. If you are a little Christ, if you're living like Jesus, think about what they did to Jesus, right? What did they do to Jesus? They killed him. They didn't just kill him. They beat him. They scourged him. They nailed him to a cross. They did all manner of horrible things. They spat on him. They cursed him. And you go on and on. The list goes on and on and on. So, little Christ, if you're living like him, do you expect any less? Do you expect any less? Yet, we here today about being oh what are they going to think of me oh they're going to give me an awkward look or oh they maybe don't want to hear what i have to tell them so what the great commission isn't force these people to get saved it's go teach go tell is not your concern if somebody gets saved that's the holy spirit's job it is your job to give what you have already received. Point number three, this mission, this mission is a dead man's mission. And what I mean by that is when I was in college, I heard a pastor explain this to me about being offended and dealing with people. He was talking about how he had gone through a lot of issues in his church and how he was getting slandered up the pole. And he said this, and he just kept saying it. He says, you can't hurt a dead man. You cannot hurt a dead man. That means when you die to yourself, when you to your flesh talks about what's you're realizing that it's not about you, it's not about what they do to you, it's not about what they say to you, it's not about what they think about you, it's about him. It's about him. You start to realize, man, this is just dead. This flesh just dead. You can't hurt a dead man. In this mission that we are called to do, if you're going to accept it, if you're going to live it, hey, on to the next person. 
I can't tell you how many people have slammed the door in my face out, door knocking, how many people have cursed me out, how many people have cursed out my God. It's okay. God says it is worse for them. It's not my problem what somebody does to me, thinks to me, says to me. Because this mission that God has given me, this mission that God has given you, it's a mission specifically for a dead man. Verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. This mission that every Christian is called to do, it's the Great Commission. It's a mission of faith. It's a dead man's mission. But please understand, it's a mission of pain. It is a mission of pain. Talking about these common men, these unlearned men, we have church tradition and church history that talks about how they died. And there's some different variations because it's not the word of God. We don't know for sure, but church tradition says this of Peter. He was crucified head down at his own request, crucified upside down. Andrew was severely scourged, tied by ropes to an X-shaped cross where he hung for two days before dying. James was beheaded with a sword. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew was beaten, flayed, and crucified head down. Thomas was lanced by idolatrous priests and burned up in an oven. Matthew was axed to death with a halberd. James thrown down from the temple tower and was clubbed to death. Thaddeus crucified. Simon crucified. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Paul, not one of the twelve mentioned here, but an apostle, was beheaded. These men that we just read about, alive and well with Jesus, they start doing the mission, they start doing the work in pain. And before all of that, man, they went through so much. Only one disciple wasn't killed in a horrible way, and that was John. But he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and he went through much persecution. Some say he was boiled in oil and still survived and kept doing what he was doing. Paul, before his day, he was brought out of a city, brought out of a city. The city gathered around him, stoned him. He got back up, and where did he go? Right and back into the city. Because he understood, and if anybody understood it well, it was Paul. This mission is a mission of pain. Take a minute, look around. All the friendly faces, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, there's always church drama. Anywhere you go, there's always going to be church drama. There's always going to be somebody you don't always work together with perfectly. But my goodness, if that's the only thing we have to worry about, wow. Right. Feel right. the cushion. Feel the cushion you're sitting on. Man, it's nice. Feel the air conditioning. I'm very thankful for that. These men went through real pain. And we're like, I can't go out soul winning today. It's too hot. And I'm not preaching at you. Honestly, I'm preaching at me. How many times do I have to fight my flesh? Lord, I'm tired. I don't want to go and, and give the gospel. Now, you, you've got to have your rest, but listen, this is a mission of pain. It's okay to be in pain. We want to be Christ-like, little Christs. Christ was a man of sorrows. Now, we don't face a whole lot of physical pain, but all three, every single one of us faces a lot of emotional pain. And what's hard about that is rarely does anybody really understand what you're going through, except him, because he went through all of this when he was doing the same exact mission. You say, God, this is impossible. How am I supposed to do this? He already did it. And right back when I read the Great Commission, Jesus Christ said, power. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be working with you. Acts 1.8 power. God is going to be with you. God is going to work with you. This mission is not one you do alone. This is one that Christ does with you. Acts 1, 8, chapter 8, verse 1. That's my bad. Emmanuel always makes fun of me because I'm really bad at numbers, and it's true. The book of Numbers is the hardest one for me to read. It's difficult, but Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, it talks about 
the power that Jesus Christ gives us, how he works with us, how he works through us. It's very comforting, but it's not on the board, so we're going to keep going. <laughs> Verse 19. But when they, delivered you, when they deliver you up, listen, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Now, hey, this is talking about them facing government. This is talking about them facing trial and execution. But we can certainly apply it for, hey, witnessing. Absolutely. What am I going to say to these people? what God has to say. If you're spirit-filled, and if you're living in the will of God, it's just going to flow out of you. Think about the woman at the well. My goodness, how could she talk about Jesus? She barely even knew him, but she did. And what she said? Her testimony. Say, hey, this is what I freely received, and now I want to freely give it to you. Go to this man. Go to this man. That doesn't sound too terribly hard, does it? Go to this man. Go. Hey, hey, person at the gas station, have you heard about Jesus? No? Let me tell you about him. Hey, waitress, you know Jesus. Hey, guy in line, ever heard about Jesus? You'd be surprised. Many people don't actually know a thing about Jesus. There's so many people walking the streets with their crucifixes and their tattoos, and, and I'll go to them and ask, hey, do you know what that is right there? I say, no. Let me tell you about it. Because that right there that you're hanging from your neck, my God hung from that for you. And the beautiful thing about witnessing, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Not mentally, because it's always like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? But if you let God work, he will just flow through you. Don't worry about what you're going to say, because it's God who's doing the work. You're just the vessel. You're just the tool. Praise God. My goodness. I'm so thankful that we don't have to do this work on our own because I would mess it up big time. I would mess it up big time. So we're at verse 19, verse 20, verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth the end shall be saved. That's not talking about salvation, by the way. A lot of people say, endure to the end, endure to the end, keep the faith, keep it. No, you can't lose your salvation. That endure to the end, that talking about saved, saved from death. Basically meaning, hey, if you're in the will of God, even when your father and your mother and your sister and brother, they forsake you and they deliver you up and they betray you and you, they backstab you and you go through all this pain and suffering, if you endure to the end, if you stay in my will, then you're going to die exactly when I want you to die. No sooner, no later. Because my goodness, and learn from people who walk away from God how, how, how much they just shorten their life. I can't think about, uh, it's sad to think about all the lives that have been shortened because of drugs, all the lives that have been shortened because of sin, all the ways people have deviated from God's will in their life and how their life was shortened. God has, and Pastor Barry says it so much, God has a specific time for you to die and a specific place for you to die. That's for you. But my goodness, if you're not in the will of God, you're never going to see that day. Right. You're never going to see that day. So the Bible says, if you endure till the end, if you stay in the faith, if you stay in my will, your life's not going to be perfect, but my goodness, when you get to the end of it, you're going to die exactly when I want you to. You're going to fulfill my plan for you. And who doesn't want to do that? That idea. Your family hating you. Your family rejecting you. All because you're a Christian. All because you want to tell them how not to go to hell. And they turn their back on you. Verse 22, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. Keep preaching. For verily I say unto you, ye shall have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above the master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. Remember, discipleship, life transfer. And the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Belizebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? They slandered God. Don't be surprised when your own family, the people you love most, slander you. See, when you get to a point, when you get to a point where you say, I'm a dead man, my life, 
It doesn't matter to me at all. My comfort doesn't matter to me at all. What matters is Jesus. Wow, what bliss. <laughs> what bliss. It's not a peaceful life. No way is it a peaceful life but it's the life God has for you, and that brings much inner peace. That brings true joy. Living for God, living in God's will, talking about, hey, the pain that you're going to go through, if you are living in the center of God's will, what else are you going to do? I mean, that's where God wants you, right? And his ways are higher than our ways. He knows better. I see the time we're going to be moving on here. It's a mission of pain. Number five, it's a mission of promise. Verse 26, fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall, be, shall not be revealed and hid that shall be not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who's that? It's God. So we shouldn't be fearing man because all they can do to us is, is kill this and hey it's already dead right what we should be worried about is what god thinks what god says what god wants verse 29 are not two sparrows sold for a farthing and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father but the very hairs of your head are all numbered number five it's a mission of promise you say there's so much pain you're going to be so many so many awful look what god promises hey you read the back of the book and we win you look around all oh, the world is so awful the world's so terrible jesus wins you don't have to worry you don't have to be concerned you just have to keep preaching jesus and hey even the quiet ones the people's like oh, i don't i don't talk very much preach jesus preach jesus in your life there's a guy named jack chick he wrote chick tracks little comic books and i love him i love to give him out gives the gospel that man hated to talk to people he was so terrified to give the gospel, but God gave him the gift of art. He was a comic book artist. And so what he did, he sat down and he wrote these tracks. And there's so much controversy around him, but billions of those tracks have gone all over the world and testimony after testimony after testimony. That's how he preached Jesus. And I'm telling you, you don't have to be standing on the street like Pastor Barry preaching to City Hall and everyone who passes by. You need to do what God tells you to do. You need to preach how God tells you to preach. And this is... Last thing I want to tell you, the last thing I want to tell you, point number six, go back to point number one, it's the, our mission is our commission. Point number two, it's a mission of faith. Number three, it's a dead man's mission. Number four, it's a mission of pain. Number five, it's a mission of promise. And number six, it's an exclusive mission. Verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me, he is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. What do I mean by this mission is exclusive? It goes right back to the beginning. It's exclusive for Christ. It's exclusive for little Christ. You can't complete this mission if you're in and out of church you can't complete this mission if you're sitting on the fence you can't complete this mission if you're not entirely sure that you're even saved your mission is the great commission and the title i put for this sermon is this is your mission if you choose to accept it it's a choice after all that i told you about this mission and some of you have been in the faith for a long time you're well acquainted with what i'm talking about Hey, today, have you chosen it? Today, have you decided, I'm going to do this thing? I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to preach Jesus. Are you going to accept this mission? Are you going to rededicate yourself to this mission? Hey, <laughs> it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. Let's bow our heads. If you're here tonight and you realize, hey, I could be doing more. I, say, I, already, I already do so much. I'm already do this and I do that. If, that's not what I asked. I said, if you know, if God is putting his finger somewhere in your life and say, hey, you can do more, why don't you come forward? Accept 
that mission. The altar is open. If you want to come and dedicate yourself, it's not, it's not fun. My goodness, this mission is awful. Pain and suffering, but it will be worth it all when you see Jesus. Listen, dear ones, I'm going to have Garrett take the time of invitation. It was his message, and I believe the Spirit will work through him to guide us to the altar, if that's where we ought to be. But I want to tell you ahead of time, I think there are a few songs that go so well with what uh, we're going to be doing in invitation time than uh, he's always been faithful. Amen. He's with us every second of the That's day, right. every second of the night. Garrett, take us, won't you? God wants soldiers. God wants you. The fact that you're saved, even in this building, shows that God has a purpose for you. I don't know what it is. I can just tell you he wants you to preach. Maybe not like how I'm doing it, but he wants you to preach. Preach Jesus. Go ye into all the world. Teach all nations, baptizing them. Come on now. If God is stirring your heart, if God is putting a finger in, uh, right on your heart and pointing, hey, this thing in your life, you need to get it right. You need to rededicate yourself. You need to go forward for me. This is the mission you've got to accept. I invite you to come forward. If you're that person that I mentioned who doesn't know for sure that they're going to heaven, get it settled. I was that person. I grew up in church my whole life. I didn't get saved till just recently because I thought, I'm in church, I'm doing good, I'm, you know, I'm trying to live like God told me, but I wasn't sure. Let me ask you, if you were to die tonight, right now, if your heart was to stop beating, would you be in heaven? If not, come forward. Get it settled. You can't go forward for God until you have him in your heart. Holy God, I thank you. I thank you that you would want to call us to this mission field. I'm thankful that you would place these people in this town, in this time. Lord, you made us for such a time as this. Everything that's going on in the world, we're here today for a very specific purpose. Help each individual in here to fulfill that purpose, to go forward, to complete their mission. I pray you'd comfort them. Comfort me. It's a scary world, but you are a great, great God. Go with us as we leave. Work in our hearts. Stir us, Lord. I pray that we walk out of this building different than how we walked in. Help us to fulfill the Great Commission, even tonight, if you give us the opportunity. I ask your blessing, and I want to just tell you how much we love you. And in your holy name, amen. Why don't you stand with us, dear ones? We'll sing this last song. That invitation is open. You go right ahead and go on up front or pray right there.